Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. Well, thank you guys. Uh, Can we have a big hand for Jesus today? God is good today. He's faithful. Thank you so, so, so much uh, for all of that right there. I I feel so grateful and uh, honored to be exactly where I am. Uh, This church means so much to me. I I woke up this morning with a tremendous feeling of gratitude. Uh, Thankful to be here and thankful to be alive. I did 50 push-ups in a row this morning. And uh, on my 50th push-up, I was trying to do one for every year of gratitude. And on my 50th one, I got up and I almost died. And then after it was over with, uh, a a thought came to my mind. And here's the thought that came to my mind. Uh, People ask me all the time, and they've been asking me for a while about my 50th birthday. Do I feel different? And and, and honestly, I don't. I have not felt different until today. And this morning when I woke up, I was trying to think about what the difference was and the way I feel about the Lord. And I would say it's this. I woke up. I didn't think about this. It's just really what the Holy Spirit was saying in me. Every other year of my life, I kind of get up and I think, how can I do more? Or like, what else can I try? What else? How can I make a bigger impact? How can I do this? How can I do that? And I really woke up today thinking, how can I do less? And I know that sounds strange, but what John said, when John said, I must decrease that he can increase. It it started making sense to me more than ever. What that actually means is that when I do less, he can do more through me. And I want to be more strategic uh, about what it means when I get the opportunity to be in front of people or to be seen. But I'm going to talk a little bit today Uh, First of all, thank you so much, my wife, Amy. That was so sweet. All the stuff she planned, all my friends that, uh, all my friends that sent thank yous. That was so kind. Uh, Mom and dad, your stories, mom, your song. I hate when you sing that song. I always cry. Uh, It's so, so beautiful. Uh, I'm truly grateful for the painting and and my best friend, Jason. uh, It's great to have really good friends. Jason, we've been friends since uh, I was, I mean, my, my dad was named after your uncle, uh, so our families go back, you know, 60 years or something like that. So it's long, long, 70, 70, 80 years or something. It's crazy. Uh, so, yeah, you're, you're, you're the best, man. And Jason and Mindy pastor New Life Church in Titusville, and they have a phenomenal, fantastic church, one of the best churches on the Space Coast. They're there every week preaching. So they took off from church uh, to come here today. So that's a big deal for a senior pastor. So could you honor pastors uh, Jason and Mindy for being here today? Appreciate that. And Mindy's work as an artist, by the way, she's truly not just uh, an artist that I uh, appreciate, but she is totally brilliant, has done some of the most incredible commissions for large galleries, restaurants, been in magazines uh, all over the place. Her art is incredible. So it really is amazing what she's done. And I think I think I might want to put Revival or Parish in our foyer. Uh, so everyone can enjoy it and be a part of it. So I'm really honoring you. I'm fired up about that painting. I don't know. I might stare at it a little bit and want to put it in my studio. Do you never know? It's, it, there could be a possibility it's in the foyer, but thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to jump right into this message. I'm excited in this season that we're in. I'm excited about Blink. Yesterday was the tryouts for Blink, uh, and, and it was incredible. The vision that we're casting for this Blink is phenomenal. I'm so fired up. It's called Blink. A dark and light. It's a brand new concept uh, in Blink. We've never done anything like this. This is the 24th year since I wrote Blink in, in 1998. I believe it's going to be the best we've ever seen. Uh, really, really excited about the creative elements. Also, another thing I want to share before I jump into this on how good God is. They say that it takes four miracles to make a major motion picture. There's the miracle of getting it financed. And when you're talking about a $6 million film like my film, uh, that just doesn't happen. Uh, We had a miracle and got it financed. It's the miracle of finishing the movie. Uh, We shot our movie during the middle of COVID. We were the only major motion picture in the country that was shooting with all the SAG 
uh, restrictions that were going on on the Screen, Screen Actors Guild. They didn't even want people making movies, so they put restrictions that were unrealistic so you couldn't even do it. Like, for instance, our actors in between takes had to put down shields over their face uh, where you had to completely redo their hair and makeup in between each take and rehearsals. It was crazy. No one was shooting. The one benefit that we had was that we got to use everyone that was on, like, uh, Avengers Endgame, Spider-Man, all these different people got to be my camera crew and things like that. And for instance, I also got Carmen Cabana, who was my director of photography. She's got the number one show right now on Netflix. She was the prime cinematographer, did every episode of Resident Evil on Netflix and the number one show on Disney. She was the prime main DP on Mrs. Marvel that's on Disney. So she got two number one shows right now and then our movie. So we had the miracle of making the movie. Then you have the miracle of finishing the movie. You would be surprised how many movies get finance and they get made but they never get finished they never get edited we were able to finish it and then there's that last miracle that you need that has taken two years for us and it hasn't happened of getting the distribution deal signed done finished that has not happened until friday friday we signed the final deal southern gospel is coming out it's going to be in theaters in January and on streaming services in January. So I'm excited about how faithful and good God is. Gave me a little birthday present while I was still in my 40s, actually. Uh, I was fired up about that. That's a distant memory. But I've got something for you here today um, that I'm really fired up about. By the way, Revival Nights or Revival Sundays are coming. And we're going to be here on uh, Sunday mornings with some of the most awesome preachers and speakers from all over the world going to be here on Sunday mornings. In the next couple months, you're going to see some incredible things. So tell your friends, get people here at City of Life. This is a season to be bringing. I look at someone next to you and say, I'm a bringer. Come on, say it like you mean. Say, I'm a bringer. You bring people to church. That's what we do. That's our culture. We talk to people. We invite people. We meet people. We say, hey, you got to come check out my church. It's just part of who we are at City of Life. But uh, I've got something for you found out of 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21. Here's what the story says. It says, so Elijah who, by the way, Elijah was like the Michael Jordan of prophets of, at the time. He was the greatest of the great. The, the, he was the goat. He was the Tom Brady. There was no one to compare him to at this particular time. He had God's anointing on him so strong. Uh, he spoke, spoke with such precision, such power, such miracles. And he was going along. God had told him to go find this guy named Elisha, similar name, and to to anoint him, throw his cloak on him, which was representative of transferring the calling that's on your life to someone else's life. So in 1 Kings 19, 19, it says, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Elisha was living his life in a field, plowing a field that did not represent the full measure of his calling, and he was very unseen. So the name of my message for you today is called Unseen. Father, I just ask in Jesus' name today that you would bless this time together. Thank you for everyone that is watching online. Lord, I pray right now you would be with them in the middle of their struggle, the difficulties, the challenges they're facing them, facing right now. You would encourage them, fill their heart up with hope to trust in you that all things are possible in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the people that are here in this room. Lord, I pray the power of your Holy Spirit would move in this place. We would see miracles, people that are running low on faith. Lord, would the, the hope of Jesus would be made known to them and they could walk out of here excited about who they are in you, seeing a miracle. Let your word come alive. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. You ever been through a season of your life where you felt like you were just kind of wasting your time? Come on, if, if, you're, if you're being honest, just raise your hand. You ever been through a season where you felt like you couldn't even see the benefit of the time period that you were in? Maybe it was a time where you were in school. Maybe it was a time where you once had a position and maybe you got demoted. Maybe you're in a time of silence or a season where no one knows you or a season where no one knows the talent that you have. No one knows the ability that you have. Maybe that's gone on. Maybe you had a high position that was very visible and you've had to step back and let other people take over. Maybe you feel a little bit unseen. So now that we're knowing what, now you know what I'm talking about. 
Anyone, would you like to raise your hand and say, I've been through a season like that really quick? Okay, so I'm connecting with some people here today. I remember my dad, when you finally get a chance to see Southern Gospel, you're going to see in Southern Gospel, my dad, who was always a very talented guy, went through multiple seasons, where he, and even decades, where no one knew who he was. He had to get whatever job he could get to just pay the bills to start his church and have the dream that he and mom had of starting a church someday. So they played in nightclubs for a while, played music. They grew up in church, and when they got kicked out of the organization that they grew up, because my dad would not preach a particular kind of doctrine that they wanted him to preach that said you couldn't make any mistakes. He said, that's not true. You do make mistakes, but Jesus is there for us, and he forgives us. They said, no, you don't make any mistakes. He said, well, I can't preach that. They said, well, you're done. And he was out, so he had to find his own way. And in that whole process, when he was, uh, you know, they didn't know anything else other than ministry, didn't know how to do anything, and never had any other job but ministry, so they started playing in nightclubs. They knew how to play music, and they played in Orlando, down at the Kaler Hotel, right down on Lake Eola, uh, and, and they played there every night. And he's standing in that place, this talented, passionate preacher and my mom a ministry person who had all this ability and the people that used to go watch them and put money in the tip jar had no idea the talent that was standing right in front of them you ever been through a season where you feel like no one recognizes you well my dad uh, in that particular season was working on a railroad and he, in in the daytime he had a job where he was literally driving spikes on a railroad my dad sold coffins <laughs> my dad uh, cleaned carpets uh, my grandma used to be his, uh, before, you know, you could have like paid ads on Facebook or something. My grandma used to call people and say, hi, this is Alan's carpet cleaning service. Would you like us to come clean your carpet for forty nine ninety five? I remember I was, she used to cold call people right out of the phone book. And, and I mean, did whatever they could to make a living. But there were seasons where no one wanted to hear what they had to say. Seasons of silence. Seasons where they were unseen. And here in this story, we have this guy who we later discover is one of the greatest men of God that's ever lived named Elisha. But he doesn't seem like the greatest man of God. Because what's he doing? He's got 12 oxen in front of him. He's got the pair in the back that he's kind of, he's just in this big open field. He's just plowing. And he just looks like any normal worker. But Elijah is sent to him from God, and God says, you go anoint this guy. This is the guy I have chosen to succeed you, to succeed you. And he is going to have the anointing that you have, and he's going to take it to a completely different level. So he finds him in the middle of his work. Can I tell you something? Never judge somebody's destiny by the size of the field that they're currently in. You don't judge a person's destiny by the size of the field they're in. I believe that there are world changers sitting in this room right now that if you looked at them, you wouldn't know it right now. Why? Because God's working on them in the unseen place. God's working on them in the quiet place. You have to be go willing to go through seasons where nobody knows who you are so God can build character in you. Did you know that Jeff Bezos, when he was young, flipped burgers at McDonald's? What if someone would have written him off? One of the richest men in the world now, Amazon, but one day flipping burgers. Did you know that Obama served ice cream? Did you know that Oprah worked at a grocery store? Did you know that Pope Francis, the Pope, was a bouncer at a club? <laughs> That's kind of hot right there, ain't it? I love that. You can't ever write somebody off and say, oh, that guy's a bouncer in a club. Who would believe? Well, he, be careful. He's going to be the Pope someday. Yeah, right. <laughs> Come on, guys. God never starts with finished products. God always finds flawed, broken people. And why doesn't he start with finished products? If he started with a finished product, he wouldn't get any of the glory. Because everyone would look at that person and say, well, obviously he can use them. They're the best, the best looking. They're the smartest. They're the brightest. And, 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 you know, just God doesn't get the glory. But he loves starting from someone that no one would ever suspect it would be them. So he can get the glory. He loves finding broke down, messed up, worn out people that he can call out of where they are. And he can put them his hand on them and call them somewhere new. So in this story... Elijah is in a field, and you know what he's doing? He's being faithful. 
I don't know what your field looks like right now, but I know that it might not be very interesting to you. It might not seem very exciting to you. You might be given some tasks and some measures that you feel like are below you. Think of the spiritual insight that Elisha had needed to have to follow Elijah and to absorb all of that stuff and to be able to effectively discern how to... He had to be a brilliant guy. He had to be a, 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 a very uh, intuitive kind of person to be able to process that kind of information and be a conduit for the Holy Spirit to move through. So someone that is that talented, that's just sitting around with, you know, staring at the rear end of animals that are dumber than him. You say, Pastor Jeff, I can relate at my job. I mean, that's just the way it works. But you have to be a pretty faithful person to have this level of ability, but to say, I'm just going to be faithful over what you've assigned me to. You know, a lot of people say, well, God just hasn't spoke to me. Well, I would just suggest for you to do the last thing he did speak to you. And to keep doing it and 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 and don't stop. And then if you can't figure anything else out, just be faithful. Just read your word. Just pray. Just be kind. Just honor God. Just let the light of Jesus show through you in the little things. You say, well, he's only assigned me to clean an area at my job. That's all I do. I just clean this area. You make it the cleanest area that anyone has ever seen. You let the glory of God be seen in everything your hands touch. You make sure that everything that your name is attached to. Can you hear me today? Can somebody just listen to me? You make sure everything that your name is attached to is fantastic. Make sure that everything that has your name on it is exemplary. It shines. Why? The Bible says we don't work for men. We work for God. When people see something I've done, the last thing I want them to say is, oh, here's another thing from Jeff. Nothing is labeled right. Nothing is, uh, he just throws it out there. It's, it's half-hearted. It's not great work. And I, I mean, he probably got potential to do stuff, but he never put, no, I want people to look at the stuff that I do and say, I can't believe you did this. I can't, how did you do this? This is amazing. Did you write this? Did you work on this? Who played on this? Who did that? that that's the effect that I want to have. And it may not be the greatest in the world, but I want it to be the greatest that I can do. Why? Because I want to be faithful in the field that God has given me. We complain about the size of our platforms. Why would God ever give you a bigger platform if you haven't filled the platform he's already given you? I'm sorry, if you're driving around an old beater car and you got french fries in between your seat and you ain't cleaned your rims in about six months, please don't think to yourself that if you ever drove a brand new Mercedes that you wouldn't have french fries because you got french fries in that thing too. You're going to have dirty rims in that car too. If Whatever you have on a small level, you can almost guarantee you're going to have that on a big level if you ever get the opportunity. So why not take... Uh, come on, somebody should clap at that today. I think so. Why not take the opportunity... Look at four people around you say, crush it at the level you are right now. You know why? That might be the only level you ever get to. How do we know? How do we know how long we have to live our lives? We may graduate to heaven tomorrow. We don't know. If you're always living your life, say, I'm going I'm to crush my level so I can get to the next level. It, it, it's not about the next level. It's about this level. Yeah. It is about being faithful on this level. He determines the levels. The Bible says promotion comes from the north. That means from God. We don't figure it out. We don't do the job that we do so someone will promote us. We do the job that we do so God will be proud of us with what we're doing right there. And we got to be willing To be unseen. We have to be willing to be. Nobody has thanked me or noticed. That might be a good thing. Because the question is, will you keep working hard when no one notices? Will you keep being faithful when no one notices? And when I mean no one, I mean no one on this planet. Because there's somebody that sees and notices everything. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, that man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. He sees, he notices. So you're not unseen by God. You may be unseen by people, but you're not unseen by God. See, God will 
sometimes set you under something or someone simply to see if you're willing to be under authority. There's a lot of people say, oh, boy, I can't wait till I, I get put over someone. Well, he won't put you over someone until you faithfully sat under someone. He'll put you under authority to see how you respond under authority. God don't care how many people you're over. Who are you under? I knew that wouldn't get very many amens, but it should. He don't care how many people you're over. He cares about who you're under. If you you think it feels good to be under someone... It does feel good in being secure, but sometimes being under people, it hurts because they'll tell you the truth that nobody else will tell you because they don't care. And what I mean is they don't care about offending you. They care about helping you. See, and somebody that cares about helping you is willing to say the hard things to you that anyone under you doesn't have the courage to say. I get worried, very worried when I see people that have a lot of people under them and they're not under anyone else. Because when you submit yourself to someone that, and you give them the ability to say something, to be careful when you do it. And I know when I say be careful because I do it, and I've done it not only with my parents, but I've done it with other people in ministry that I say, look, I want to let you know, I'm submitting myself, and, and what you see, if you see me doing something or that, that is weird or strange you don't understand, please just speak to me and call me out on it and pick up the phone, text me, let me know that you want to talk about something. I'm down. You know what you think sometimes is that if I say that, they'll think, oh, he's humble, and then they won't ever call me. But no, you better be careful. If you say it to the right people, they'll hit you. They'll say, yeah, you said call you. Man, what's that one thing you said? That's weird. You know, they'll, they'll say some stuff to you. And, and that's what it means to be under. To be under means to stay submitted under God's authority. And you say, well, that person's flawed. Welcome to humanity. You ain't going to be under someone that's not flawed. Everybody's got flaws. See, but, but God will set you under something to see how faithful you will be when you ain't running the show. And in this case, you got a guy that's out there. He's from a wealthy family. We know this because it says Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola. And that particular person that he was from and that place he was from and the amount of oxen that he had was a lot. It was like having a lot of nice houses or something in Dr. Phillips or something. It was like a way that you could know that someone is a little bit bougie. So he comes from this bougie kind of life, but he's out there putting in the work. Ain't nobody watching him. He's just being faithful like a regular day. Can I tell you something? The reason why it's great to be faithful in your field is you never know what day it is that you're just going to go to work or go to school or do the thing that he's called you to do. You you put a normal outfit on. You ain't trying to look super great. You ain't expecting nothing. You're just going to do hard work. Okay, it's time to work. And all of a sudden, you don't know what day it is that God's going to send an Elijah your way. And he's going to come up in the middle of your work when no one is watching. And he's going to cast that mantle on you. You're going to say, what's going on? What are you even doing? All I'm doing is just doing my work. And he says, oh, me too. And God sent me to elevate you. You don't know when Elijah's coming, but one thing is for sure. You ain't never going to get no mantle cast on you if you're not faithful to the field that God has called you to work in. You be, put, look at five people around you say, I got to be faithful to the field. Come on, tell someone, I got to be faithful to the field. Got to be faithful to the field. Somebody had to run out and get David. Because when Samuel, the prophet Samuel, went to Jesse's house, to find the next king and to anoint the next king, he brought out all of his sons. And he's going down the list. He goes, that ain't it. That ain't it. It ain't him. It ain't him. It ain't him. It ain't the tall one. It ain't the strong one. It ain't the good one. You got any more? They're like, man, this is it. We gave you the best of the best. And someone's like, oh, we got our little brother. I mean, you can't want to see him. He just, he's like, he, he hangs out with the sheep all day. He's just a little guy. So go get him. I got to see him. And, and all he did is stay out there with the sheep. But I'll tell you what's, what's sick about David, what's amazing about his personality, is when he had the courage to fight Goliath, when he heard that Goliath was cursing out Israel, he remembered, I have fought the bear. I have fought the lion that was trying to get my sheep. And you know what? I killed him. 
I killed them. I learned how to defend myself and I learned how to be brave in a small format. So now when God enlarges the stage and it's time for you to shine, you've already got the confidence that you forged when no one was looking. He had no audience. When he was getting his training, he had no audience. But when he finally got to center stage, the whole world was watching. And that's why we still hear stories about it. See, what God teaches you when no one is looking is the thing that will make you who you are when the whole world is watching. Why do you think Jesus, after great miracles, used to immediately retreat to go pray alone, by himself. He would get in silence and in solitude. Everyone's like, ooh, Jesus, fed the 5,000. Oh, that's the best fish I ever had. Oh, how did you do it? You make it taste so good, Jesus. And like Jesus is like, I'm out. I got to go. They're like, no, hang out at the after party. We're just getting started. He's like, I'm, I'm out, y'all. You have the after party. I got to go spend time with my father. Why? Because i got to go remind myself of who I actually am. Because if I start hearing all these things that I've done, I may miss the point of everything. I am who I am because I want to lift Him up. I am who I am because of the things He's told me when I'm alone. I am who I am because of the character I've built, because of the way I use the word in my day-to-day life. What happened to Jesus when he was in the wilderness? Everything the devil threw at him, he came back with the word. He said, turn these stones into bread. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He started breaking off the word. Everything the devil said, he came back with scripture. Why? He learned all that. By himself when no one was watching. He was unseen. It's okay to be unseen. Maybe you're getting older and you're in a season of your life where your kids are gone. Maybe it's time for you to get into a season of learning again. You say, but I'm I'm 60. Who cares? Maybe you're in a season now where it's time to start learning again. It's time to go back to the basics and take all the knowledge that you have Take all the wisdom you have. Learn how to write. Learn how to express yourself in a brand new way. Learn how to use technology. Learn how to do new things and dream and create new ideas and start new businesses. But you might go through a whole season, another 10 years, where no one ever hears that. You're forging something in the silence. You're forging something. When you think the best days are behind you, you say to yourself, man, everybody used to know who I was. I believe that the best is always in front of you when you're willing to give up your own glory in exchange for God's glory. I believe the best is always in front of you. So I believe today, if there are some people that are willing to be unseen, there's no limit to what God will do through you. God always finds us in the field. He always finds us in the field. So get back in your field. You haven't been abandoned. You haven't been abandoned. You know, I remember as a young man when I was 18, 19, when I moved out to Dallas, um, I had a a trajectory from my life that I thought was going to happen. When I walked across the stage at St. Cloud High School at Tupperware, uh, I graduated from St. Cloud High School in 1990. And you can watch the video back. When I walked across the stage, it says, This is Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey is going to get a record deal with a major Christian record label. Going to go to college. And he's going to become a producer. And then someday he's going to take over his dad's church. So I remember, I didn't know how. And I used to tell people all the time, I'm like, yeah, I got a record deal. I didn't, I I lie. I didn't even have one yet. I was like, yeah, I got a deal with Murrah Records. That's the biggest label in the world. That's like telling someone right now that you you have a record deal with Sony or something and you don't know anyone from Sony. I used to say, like literally within like a month of saying that, I got a deal with the place that I was talking about. God just opened up doors, worked out things, and I started going down this road. So I thought that I wanted to be the kind of artist that was doing all these different things and I would just... Say, God, please open these doors, please. And I wanted, I thought that I was ready for people to know who I was and to share, you know, to enlighten everyone. And I just kept running into these closed doors. And it brought me back here. 
to become a youth pastor again. I had already been, I was like the second time that I had been a youth pastor. And I didn't know what to do because like the, I had some talents in different areas, but I just didn't know what to do. I felt stuck. So I, start, I turned to the Lord and I started reading my Bible over and over again, cover to cover. And I remember praying the most humble prayer that anyone could ever pray. I said, God, give me an anointing for thousands. <laughs> and God said, no. I said, excuse me? He said, no, I will never give you an anointing for thousands until you get a heart for one. I was like, whoa. I was like, whoa, whoa. Like that is, what does that even mean? And he said, you figure it out. So I didn't know what to do. So I'm, I'm in my late 20s. I, I started reading books on apologetics. I started reading, you know, that's, I was in school at that time. So I started taking stuff that I was learning, and I would just go down to gas stations, and I would just start talking to people. I would, I would say, hey, man, what's up? My name's Jeff. I just was going to ask you if you you know, know Jesus. If, if you were to die tonight, do you know if you'd go to heaven or hell? And they'd be like, uh, hell? I'd be like, you don't have to. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. Let me tell you about him right now. And I'd say, do you want to pray? They'd be like, yeah. You know, and so I mean, I, it just started happening like that. So I got addicted to doing that. So I used to, I went from there to down to, it used to be called downtown, like Disney Springs used to be called Pleasure Island. So I used to go out to Pleasure Island and I would take a paper with me and a pen and I would just start talking to people. And I started finding that maybe like one out of every two people that I would talk to wanted to pray and accept Jesus in their heart. So I just was leading people to God. And then all of a sudden I started, I would try to get like 10 people to talk to me and it just wouldn't work because I only had an anointing for one. But after I kept doing it over and over, I got that anointing for one. But you know what happened? There was one time where I said to 10 people, I said, hey, guys, will you come over here? They're like, yeah, what's up? What do you want? I was like, my name's uh, Jeff. I want to talk to you about it. And I said, do you want Jesus? And everyone was like, everyone lifted their hand. I was like, well, you know, bow your heads and close your eyes. We, we pray. They all pray. They're crying. Like the security guard for Disney walked up. He's like, hey, sir, you can't. Oh, it's you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you're, you're, you're good. You're good. Uh, so like I would just go out there, and then, so then it started turning into like twenty. I would I'd grab like twenty people. I never forget Venus here, Yuli and Vina. I love these guys; they're amazing, awesome, awesome members of the church. Have been here a long time and served faithfully. But I, I remember Yuli or, or Vina. You were just a teenager. You were out at Pleasure Island one time uh, before you were even saved, and you were in a big group. And I actually prayed with you, and you gave your heart to Jesus in that group. And I'll never forget before you even went to the to the church. Years later, you saw me out. This is now, it's like 15 years ago, even when this happened. But you came up to me at a gas station. You're like, hey, you're that guy that prayed with me and my friends that time. And I got saved. And then Vina now runs our K5, K5 prep, like our pre-K uh, program here at City of Life. She's one of our teachers here at school. But just showing you that that anointing for the one when nobody knew who I was, turned into anointing for 10 and for 20. And you know what happened after that was over with? I came home and I said, how could I reach more people? Could it be through music or whatever? And literally God gave me the vision for Blink. That's how I got the vision for Blink. And when we started doing Blink, I'm telling you straight up, the first time that we started doing Blink, at one o'clock in the afternoon, there would be three to 5,000 people that would show up here and would be lined up around this building and we would have to give away tickets to multiple shows, seven o'clock, nine o'clock, 11 o'clock. You could not pack them in here enough. I got my vision for making movies and films based on Blink and you know what? I had the anointing for the thousands at Blink. God gave me the anointing for the thousands. Why? Because I was willing to go unseen for all those years. And now I'm reaching a point in my life where I would almost prefer to be unseen. And I really mean that. Like I'm, I'm at a place now where if I'm seen and if anyone is watching me, I only want to bring glory to God. And I want to take the times that I'm not seen and make sure that I'm in his presence enough where he's filling me with something that when I am in front of people, that all they get is Jesus. That's the only thing that they see. I want to make sure that, that's the, that's, that I spend the rest of my life letting people see him and his goodness. But you have to be willing to go through those seasons where nobody knows who you are. My dad on those railroads, um, he would have this stuff on his hands called creosote. And creosote is like the grease that they put the, uh, the spikes in with. And it, it's, like, has, it's like acid. Uh, it's really greasy, but like it, it will burn the, your skin off. I used to come home with his skin like burning off. 
like dissolving. And I remember he came home and said, I was working out on the road. We lived in Pine Hills at this time. He said, I was working out on the railroad and uh, we were out in the middle of nowhere. He said, and God spoke to me on my lunch break and told me to get up and look out. And I I looked out over this area and God spoke clearly to me. He said, everything you see right now, I'm going to give you. And he didn't even know where he was. So he had to go to the foreman. And he said, by the way, he goes, where are we? Because they used to take them on these little things. You ever seen them things on like Bugs Bunny and like Tom and Jerry? They, that's, those jokers are real. They're way down there. And so th- he's out there with Wiley Coyote and Porky Pig. And they're, they're like working on the railroad. And God says, look up. And he says, the foreman, he says, where are we right now? And the foreman says, oh, that's, that's St. Cloud. Kissimmee, that's St. Kissimmee and St. Cloud. And he said, well, God said he's going to give it to me. Everything I see, he's going to give it to me. My dad never even heard of that place. The guy said, man, you can have it. Who would want it? You can have it. That was all that time. He had never even been there. And do you know where he was when he spoke that? It, right if you get off 417 on Narcusi Road in Lake Nona, that railroad track that's right there, that's the exact spot that my dad was the moment. And he was looking toward the St. Cloud Kissimmee area. That's where he was. We never even dreamed, but just within a month, God opened up up the opportunity for my parents to start this church. My dad was willing to be unseen. My parents were willing to be unseen and God opened up opportunities. Why? Because they were faithful in their field. Every place God sent them. When my mom and dad worked in nightclubs, do you know that people would come up to them after the show was over weeping, saying there's something about you guys that's so different? They would say, it's Jesus. They would say, can you pray for me? Can you lay hands on me? They got their... Everyone that worked at their nightclubs got saved. They were some of the early members of our church. Everywhere they went, they took God's presence with them. Be faithful in your field. You know, there's something about being unseen. You say, well, you know, the the Bible tells us that Jesus said, whatever I've done, you'll do also even greater things. You say, well, I want to do all the things Jesus did. Well, which part? Heal people. Say things and they happen. Well, if we're supposed to be like Jesus, there's a lot of other things he did too that we're supposed to be like. Because when I read my Bible, what I see is I see that Jesus' birth is mentioned, followed by unseen days. Then Jesus' circumcision is mentioned, followed by unseen weeks. Then Jesus is dedicated, followed by unseen months. Then Jesus is in the temple at age 12, followed by unseen years. Then he gets visited by, right before that, gets visited by the wise men. And then we have almost two decades that are unseen. He lived 33 years, 30 of those years. He was completely unseen. Only three years do we know what happened in his life. Are you willing to do what Jesus did in that way? Are you willing to be unseen for 90% of your life? Oh boy, that that 10% can sure be powerful when you've become what he wants you to be with the 90%. Did you know that an iceberg, we only see 10% of an iceberg. 90% of an iceberg is underwater. And in fact, some of the larger icebergs are indestructible. There's no way to destroy them. Isn't that interesting that that, that's the same way Jesus was. 30 years is 90% of his life. The three years that he did something was the 10 years of visibility. So you see that, you go, I want to be like that. Well, hold on. What you're talking about that is not just that, it's also what's underneath. Are you willing to be unseen? Because if you're willing to live by that formula, I believe that formula is indestructible. 90% unseen and 10% seen equals indestructible. I say that instead of pushing yourself out to the front with everything and taking photos of everything, we live in a culture where people want to be seen so much. I mean, they didn't even go to the Bad Bunny concert. They just went out to the arena the other night, took pictures of themselves out in front of the arena, like, Bad Bunny, what's up? They're not even there. They just want people to think they're there. You got people inside, pay $2,000 for tickets. They're like, yeah, we roll like that. No, you don't. You just take your pictures of it. People want to be seen everywhere. 
and get credit for things they haven't even done. Who's willing to step back from the credit? Take the spotlight off of you for a while and become somebody that God can trust and God can use. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to kind of close with Psalm chapter 1. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Even the tree in Psalm chapter one, that is the most blessed tree has seasons and not every season is a seed of fruitfulness you can st still be healthy without bearing fruit there are seasons that of winter where the tree has to just make sure it's digging down its roots and it's protecting itself so when it comes time for the fruit it's healthy enough to do so sometimes when people try to produce fruit too much they wear out their own resources and they burn out sometimes you got to go into a season where you're just quiet you're protecting your heart. You're protecting yourself, waiting for that moment where God says it's time for you to shine. Anyone excited today about the possibility of being unseen so that God can use you in a greater way? Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I want to pray two prayers. First of all, I want to pray. You bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray for people who just feel dry today. You feel like maybe you've been pushing too hard to be in the limelight or the spotlight. But today, God you realize he's calling you into a season of stepping back so that he can forge some character into you. You just want to embrace that today. I'm going to pray that if you lift your hand, that the power of the Holy Spirit would just move on you to fill you with a strength that is just totally beyond yourself. And I believe he's going to do that right now. So if you're here today and that's you, would you just lift your hand right now? If you need that prayer, I'm going to pray for everyone with their hand up. Thank you, Father. Right now, everyone that's lifting their hand, Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm them, Holy Spirit, those that are watching online that are lifting their hands in this moment, overwhelm them with your love and your goodness, that you are enough for them. Pour into them courage and strength. Lord, the fulfillment of the promise is coming. You are enough for them. You're making them who you want them to be. Lord, let them be confident, continuing and being who they are. That's enough today. I thank you for what you're doing. Holy Spirit, heal hearts today. In Jesus' name, keep your heads up bowed and your eyes closed. You can put your hands down. If you're here and you don't know Jesus today, you say, it's time for me to put my faith in Jesus publicly. It's time for me to declare Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm tired of playing around. I don't just want to say he's Lord. I want to live it. I want to give him dominion of my heart. I want to step away from the driver's seat of my life and give him control of everything. If that's you today, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand straight up over your head. Those that are watching online, I want to ask you to lift your hand straight up over your head and, and type in the chat room, type, I'm lifting my hand. I'm surrendering my heart to Jesus. And I believe lives are going to change here today. Here we go. One, the Bible says now is the time of salvation. Two, I believe everyone in this room has been called here for this very moment and God is about to move. Three, hands up all over the building if that's you today. You need Jesus in your life. Many, many hands in every single section all over this building going up. People giving their hearts to Jesus all over the place. I believe it's happening online as well. Praise God. Would you all repeat this prayer with me out loud? Say, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. I'm turning away from the old life and stepping into a brand new life with you, Lord. I will never be the same. Give me the faith to trust in you when the spotlight is not on me. I know that you're watching and I just want to be faithful in my field so you can get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.